Okay, hello everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the last meeting of 2022. I'm Melanie. I'm the admin assistant for the association and we're here we're here today with Steve Miller who's going to talk to us about the first ground combat and then the first aerial combat in the war or I guess more specifically shots fired and so Steve you'll you'll clarify exactly exactly what happened for us. And so we're going to break it into two parts. Steve is going to talk First, about the the ground segment, and we'll take questions, and then he's oh, he'll, so he'll share his screen, talk about the ground segment. We'll take he'll unshare, and we'll take some questions, so you can everyone can see each other as a group, and then we'll do the same thing with the aerial segment. So we'll get started in just a moment. Just wanted to welcome everyone who's just come in in the last few moments here. Welcome to our December meeting. And also wanted to thank everyone again. Uh, there's been a lot of renewals coming in the past few weeks over whether through the mail uh, or uh, online. So thank you everyone so much for renewing. Um, I know uh, Randy really, Randy and uh, the association president and Ed, the magazine editor, I know especially appreciate all your subscribe, all your dues, which help keep the magazine and the other activities running. So thank you so much for, for renewing. If um, I, I do have a couple pending questions from yesterday about people, uh, their membership status. So I'll get back to you shortly. And if you're not sure about your membership status or your dues, just uh, write in and ask. And we have all that information obviously in our da database for you. Okay, so without any more delay, we are going to start. So welcome again to Steve Miller, a lifelong passion for for I think US and European history and, and world history, I think it would be fair to say, Steve. And you've talked us, you've talked with us about um, about Sarajevo, about Russia, about all kinds of topics. And you're here today to talk about the first shots fired. So Steve, if you would go ahead and share your screen, we are ready to start. Okay. Okay, great. And Let's just do the whoops. Uh, right, go back to the beginning. Start at the beginning. Fine. Yep. There we go. Go to your slideshow mode if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, um, so Steve, just go to your slideshow mode. Do you see slideshow up there? The, um, on the top, the top, uh, top bar. Uh, no, I don't. Hang on a second. Oh, I got. You're right next to it. <laughs> no, no, no. Keep, keep the, keep the PowerPoint there. So you'll see a home insert. You'll see a row of text. You'll see. I see screen sharing. Yep. So in the top left of the orange window, you see slideshow. Yep. Yep. You're you're, you're almost on it. <laughs> you're almost on I it. <laughs> don't see it. Uh, Is it on the PowerPoint? Uh, yes, on the PowerPoint. Yep. I uh, don't. So don't the, so if you look on the top left, you see a little bit down, a little bit down. You see home insert draw. Design transitions slide. Ah, slideshow. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Never, okay. Never used for... that before. All right. Yeah. So how's that look? Oh, not yet. <laughs> so uh, click on slideshow again. Click. Uh, okay. Now move your play from start at the top left. Play from start. Yep. Perfect. Excellent. Ah. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Technology. Okay, we're ready. Go ahead. Thank you. Just needed some adult supervision. <laughs> That's no problem. Okay. Um. First shots. Wait a minute, I got to clear something out of the way here. First shots on uh, what became the Western Front were to August 1914 at a little town called Jean Charest, uh, about 12 miles southeast of Belfort and four miles west of what was the intersection of the French, German, and Swiss borders of the day. Recall that France had uh, lost Alsace and Lorraine after the Franco-Prussian War. Germany and France were not... Uh, Try it again. All right, what's going on? I'm sorry. Okay, Germany and France were not yet at war during the morning of 2 August 1914. At about 6 a.m., a German cavalry patrol led by Leutnant Albert Mayer entered France near the town of Corte Levant. I will apologize for my French. I know I mangle it. Moving west along of what is today the Route D 463, France had withdrawn its troops from the border as a precaution against any incident during the tense atmosphere of the time. 
Mayor's patrol was to reconnoiter the terrain and locate French forces. At about 10 a.m., a young French girl uh, drawing water from a well spotted the uh, spiked helmets of the horse-mounted patrol. He alerted a French sentry. She alerted a French sentry billeted at her home and additional French soldiers commanded by Corporal Jules André Pujot responded. Pujot demanded the Germans lay down their arms and surrender. Mayer responded by firing his pistol at Pujot, fatally wounding him. Pujot and his comrades returned fire, killing Mayer instantly. When the smoke cleared, 30 hours before their countries were at war, each side had suffered a fatality. And here's the subsequence to that. In uh, 1922, uh, French Premier Raymond Poincaré dedicated a monument to Peugeot. And by the way, the house where they were billeted is right here behind the parked cars. Uh, that house is no longer there. There's a different house. The monument featured a German woman wearing a pickle halb. And I can tell it's a woman because of the pigtails, not because of the pickle halb stabbing a Frenchman in the back. In 1940, after uh, France's defeat in World War II, this monument was destroyed. A replacement was put up in 1959, bearing a likeness of Peugeot and the wording, here on Sunday, 2 August 1914, Corporal Jules André Peugeot of the 44th Infantry Regiment was killed by Imperial and Royal Germany spilling the first French blood more than 30 hours before it declared war on France. The monument is uh, not too hard to locate, although if you're coming from the east, you might pass it. There's a turn in the road, and it's up on a slight hill. If uh, you see the, the uh, street sign, uh, Rue 44 Regiment Infantry, uh, which was Peugeot's unit, if you see that street sign, you've arrived, just look back over your right shoulder. You can't miss it. Peugeot was from uh, the village of Etoupes, not too far from Jean Charest. And he's buried in the cemetery there with the cemetery located in the Northeast portion of the town. Oh, right, there we go. It's in a uh, family plot, Peugeot Pechin. Uh, took a little searching to find it, but there's the instructions. It'll save you some walking if you decide to visit. The uh, inscription on the plaque to the right is identical to what's on the monument at Jean Charest. Uh, Mayor's uh, low grave site is a little more difficult to locate it. Hill Forth is south of Moulos. Um, I've lost, lost the distance, but uh, not too hard to locate on a map. Uh, the German military cemetery is to the east of Ilforth and up a hill. You need to cross the rail line, pick up either the Chaumont de Vignerons or the Rue St. Bryce, where they merge is close to the Chemin Hinterer Bergweg. And once you get to the top of the hill and make that turn, uh, you'll find the cemetery not very hard at all. If you climb the stone steps at the top is a inscription on the wall, which reads in both German and uh, French. And Mayer's gravesite is just to the left of the stone wall and here lies, here lies the first German fallen of the World War, 1914-1918, Albert Mayer, 2nd Lieutenant, 2 August 1914, gravesite number 4 slash 181. And here's pictures of both of them, two young men. And uh, even though their nations were not at war, they both consider their loss as the first fatality of, of their nation. Uh, that is the end of the 
that is the end of the first part. Let me see if I can get out of this. Okay, stop screen share. There we go. Have we lost Melanie? There she is. Oh, I'm here. So, um, yes, yeah, so we're just going to open it up to questions and discussion before moving on to the second part. So, um, please, it just we're a pretty small group. So, please just go ahead and, and speak up to Steve with your questions. Yes, there's plenty time. of time. The next presentation. Oh, Steve, do you have any idea one. when the first German on the Eastern Front died? Uh, offhand, no. Steve, what happened between uh, between this first shot and the actual start of the war? Did anything else happen? Well, I understand from what I've read. Uh, I don't claim to be an authority on it. There were some, uh, might have been some shots exchanged between border border policemen, um, especially uh, Germans coming across the border to see where the French were. Mm -hmm. I think also Luxembourg was invaded. Uh, about that time, uh, and somebody on Germany's side said, whoops, we didn't mean to do that. And <laughs> oh, yes, we did. Well, no, we didn't. Well, yes, we did. No, we didn't. But uh, within a couple of days, uh, the, the, the war was pretty much on, at least on the uh, Western Front as it was being formed. And there was also, I, I don't remember the date, but I'm sure that I'm sure that many of you do. I, I remember reading about the uh, Earls also early in the war, a cow, um, a cow herd, um, who he was going out to get his cows um, near. Oh, never mind. It's all. It's all gonna. It, I don't have. I don't remember enough to to put together the story again. But that's okay. But uh, the situation was pretty tense. Uh, in early August, because obviously uh, the Austrians were going to punish the Serbs and the Russians were getting ready to intervene. And the Germans said, well, if Russia's getting into the war, we've got to mobilize and, and conquer Paris before uh, we can tackle that Russian steamroller, which never materialized. But by uh, early August, uh, by certainly by the end of the first week of August, Europe was at war. So this is just the uh, the incident at Jean Charest is just a uh, minor thing uh, in the very beginning of it. But I read about it many years ago. And since I was over in that part of uh, France, I decided to go take a look and see what was see what was there. So this was really just a reconnaissance uh, activity or something that the Germans basically were... from from what I've read, uh, the French had again trying to uh, prevent an accidental uh, start of something had pulled their forces back a short distance and the Germans just wanted to find out where were the, where were the French and what kind of terrain are we going to have to to uh, master to get to them so it was a relatively minor thing and specifically nothing nothing came out of that incident I mean much bigger forces were already at play But again, just a little curious thing, the uh, first two combat deaths of each nation, whether they uh, legitimately at war or not, just something I needed to go see. And the, the fighting actually took place in France or in Germany? I... It was in France, uh -huh. uh, about um, oh, six or eight miles uh, into French territory. I think it was like about 10 kilometers or mm -hmm. thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the uh, D-463 has been named after, uh, after Peugeot. So it's, it's not too hard to find. Um, I came in from the east and went, drove right by the sign because it's up on a hill. But uh, I knew I was about the right location. So I stopped, looked around, and sure enough, there it was. Steve, does Peugeot have any connection to the Peugeot Auto Company family? I have no idea. As far as I know, uh, he doesn't. I don't know how common a name Peugeot is in, in France. Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a problem with Miller being a very common name. 
occasionally getting calls from collection agencies and I have to inform them they got the wrong Stephen Miller. <laughs> Steve, this is Scott. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, since this was happening on the border, can you say something about what the uh, the actual border conditions were? In other words, um, what 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 sort of uh, you know? Did they have some kind of fence on the on the border there? You know, how did what what exactly was that like? How did you know you you crossed from from Germany into France? Good question, because I was driving around that part of France looking for something else, and my wife and I are going up this dirt road trying to find a uh, World War I bunker, the south end of the German part of the Western Front. And all of a sudden, we see this sign with a Swiss Red Cross on it. And I said to my wife, we're not in France anymore. <laughs> so we immediately turned around. Uh, there was a border crossing nearby there. Uh, nothing nothing like a, a big big fan, fence or anything just uh, uh a police station basically and if you cross from one country to the other you just stopped and uh, they verified that uh, you weren't a known terrorist or something and you proceeded along your way i suspect in 1914 it was probably pretty much just the same situation except they didn't have paved roads uh, like we have today and fence lines just a a border station I don't know that for a fact, but I would suspect it to be the case. So it, it sounds quite informal. Uh, yes. Um, don't know what it was like in 1914, but when I, when I was in Germany uh, in the mid eight, early to mid 80s, uh, it got to the point where you crossed from France into Germany and you didn't know you were there until you, the street sign, is still the road signs change from German to French. Uh, borders, the uh, customs, customs was just non-existent. You just drove through. Yeah. And most of my, uh, most of the Western European countries I went to were pretty much that way. If that's a condition of the EU, but I know from living in Switzerland, even at that time and later, um, there was a real border crossing on roads going in to France, and you know we were 20 minutes away from the border at places. Uh, however, you know, recently in the last three or four years, the Swiss-French border is totally open. There's no guards. That's just an accommodation Switzerland's made to the EU. Yeah, I uh, on my way to Jean Charest, uh, I got stopped by a, a French border guard, and he was just curious. hadn't seen an American. I think he wanted to practice his English. And he asked me where I'm going. And I said, you've never heard of it. It's called Jean Charest. And he said, you're right. I've never heard of it. <laughs> but I, again, I've, I run into that with border guards. I think they just wanted to practice their English. And they were curious, what's an American doing here? Um, just something they didn't see every day. Steve, I'm so, just going to share like a little bit for a moment, just a little bit of a larger map. Um, everyone can see the Jean Charest is, the, is marked there with the red pin just to give everyone a sense. The, this, of course, is the modern border. Um, yeah, I'm, try, I'm trying to find it. Um, I think it's further further to the west. Yeah, oh, you're looking. Okay. Yeah, um, you, it's, uh, I think it's a bit further to the west. Um, well, wait a minute, now I'm not so sure. Uh, I don't know, I typed um, in Jean Charest, so maybe there's maybe there's two. There's a couple of Jean Charest. I'll ah, be getting to the second okay. one in, in the next part. <laughs> I, see, I see. Okay. All right. So did you locate it? Um well yeah, it was the, the one that was showing up was the, the pin there near the near uh, what okay. the Swiss border. Um, yeah. Those of us who've driven in France know the frustration of encountering towns with similar names and going to the wrong one. Don't ask me how I know. Very frustrating. The roads in France are terribly marked. <laughs> I've driven a lot of them. <laughs> All right. If uh, if we don't have any more questions about this section, we can move on to the aerial section. Steve, if you're ready, if you're ready to do that. All right. Uh, let me go. Let's see if I can find screen sharing again. Um, 
Let's see, I've lost it. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm trying to find screen sharing. I can't find it. Oh, here it is. Okay. Okay, uh, how's that look? Uh, yep, so just do the same thing that you did before with the slideshow. Slide show. All right, uh, slideshow. Nope, nope, no, 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 no. Just all right. I'll just uh, I'll just do it manually. Play play from play from start in the top left. Start. Uh, play from start. Yep. Or uh, play from current. Play from current slide. How's that look? Current. Yeah, that looks great. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, first aerial combat. Uh, most of my career was in uh, intelligence and as intelligence analyst, which bears a remarkable similarity to history. One's covert, the other's overt. I learned very early on four words you need to be very careful with. First, last, never, always. As soon as you do that, somebody will prove you wrong. So for the definition, all right, come on, let's see if I can get it. Here we go. Here's what I'm using for a definition of my presentation. A mutual exchange of gunfire resulting in the downing of an enemy airplane. Now, the first, first recorded uh, incident of two aviators firing at each other was in the 1913 Mexican Revolution. Two Americans on opposite sides exchanged revolver fire. They each missed, no consequences. And August 1914, a French pilot named Roland Garreau uh, attacked a German airplane, uh, wound up wounding one of the Germans. Uh, those of you who know anything about aviation might recognize Roland Garreau, who uh, a little bit later on developed the method of firing through the propeller arc with a machine gun. Uh, not very effective. It did work until he was captured when it uh, malfunctioned. And uh, what many consider the first uh, aerial combat victory was by a Russian staff captain, Nesterov. He rammed an Australian albatross. Uh, the thinking is he was trying to damage the upper wing of the albatross with the wheels of his airplane, uh, got tangled up in the wreckage of the upper wing and both airplanes fell and was fatal to all concerned. Now, what happened on 5 October of 1914, the French on the left, and by the way, if you're not familiar with uh, aircraft uh, national insignia, that's the French cocard on the upper left and the German cross on the upper right. Uh, an airplane of uh, squadron Voisin 24 with the two occupants shown, France and Quinault, this were returning from a uh, bombing mission, hand dropping some cannon shells, modern artillery of the day, and encountered a uh, aviatik flown uh, by uh, field, fly field flying squadron 18, the two Germans. Here's what the two airplanes looked like. Uh, the Voisin's slightly larger in size. Uh, what's important with the Voisin is the machine gun mounted here. Here's, an, uh, here's a better view of it, this drawing. And you'll see why that's important in a minute. And comparing the two airplanes in aerial combat, there are two factors. One is the skill of the pilot. The other is the capability of the airplane. Now, both were two-seat airplanes. The speeds were very comparable, the Aviatik having a slight advantage of about 11 miles an hour. That's not really significant. If you're chasing somebody and you've only got an 11 mile an hour speed advantage, that's not really significant unless you're very close. If you're at a disadvantage and you're trying to run away, again, you're kind of at a loss there. Not a significant difference. The Voisin is about 800 pounds heavier, but it has a more powerful engine, 40 horsepower versus 100. What gets significant is power loading and wing loading. The power loading is how many pounds each horsepower of the engine has to haul. And you can see both are fairly close. This is uh, a factor in speed and acceleration. The wing loading is how many pounds each square foot of wing area has to lift. And again, they're pretty close. 
wing area is a factor in maneuverability. I'm sorry, wing loading, a factor in maneuverability. A major advantage on the French side was the Hotchkiss machine gun, and both sides carried rifles. So during a morning bombing mission, Franz observed the German. Uh, von Sangen picked up a rifle and fired at him. Grenault fired his machine gun, and von Sangen learned that you don't bring a rifle to a machine gun fight. Germans lost. Uh, uh, Quinault managed to puncture the fuel tank, which caught fire, and uh, the French air, uh, sorry, the German airplane fell, and both the German aviators were killed. Here's a painting of the incident, and the French poilus down in the trenches were uh, very excited to see airplanes. Probably very few of them had ever seen an airplane before. And according to this newspaper uh, report, they jumped out of the trenches to, to watch it. The French aviators were both awarded medals, and that's a picture of them by their airplane. And there's an historical marker at Jean Charest sur Vessel, if that's how you pronounce it. I'm not sure. Uh, about 10 miles northwest of Rems. And as you approach it, uh, depending on which direction, you either get off of the E46 N31 on the Rue de, de la Robe or off the Route Nationale and find the Rue de la Guerre, Guerre being the tra uh, train station. Uh, just follow that northerly. You come to the end just before you cross the railroad tracks. There's a road leading to a parking lot named after the two French aviators. And there's a memorial plaque. Uh, we'll try to read all this in French. I can't do it. Basically, it's a repeat of what I just told you. Uh, it identifies the location of about a kilometer to the east. And... Um, this was put up in 1986. And that pretty much concludes uh, that part of the, that's the last of my presentation. So let me see if I can find, um, get back, turn off screen sharing. Um, okay. So any questions on that part? Looks like I put somebody to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Steve, I'll take a crack. What were the two planes doing when they met? Were this aerial reconnaissance or what? Well, this is very early in the war, uh, October 1914. By uh, the beginning of World War I, uh, aviation had progressed to the point of uh, and a pilot could expect to take off and land reasonably safely and an airplane could fly more than a few hundred football fields. Uh, putting guns on an airplane was relatively new. Uh, there was a uh, French pilot, Louis Strange, who mounted a uh, Lewis gun on the front of his airplane and it could barely fly. So we're uh, just a little bit past that stage. Uh, both were pretty much involved in reconnaissance. Uh, that was a very big, important role for the airplane in World War I, uh, much more important than shooting down five airplanes to become an ace, as they, uh, as they, in the movie, The Blue Max. Uh, reconnaissance, artillery spotting, uh, eventually they got radios in so they could uh, contact the uh, artillery battery and correct their fire. So, uh, uh, France had been on a bombing mission, dropped about five or artillery rounds, small rounds on, on some German target, and he was on his way home and just happened to encounter the uh, German airplane. I'm not sure what the German airplane was doing because nobody survived, but I assume they were uh, close to the French lines and probably uh, doing some reconnaissance. Where are the French trenches? Uh, are they occupied or not? Do we see any artillery batteries? So um, pretty much at a chance encounter and uh, the French had the upper hand and it, it showed.
any other questions for Steve, please go ahead and um, just you can feel free to unmute yourself and just and just ask your question or make your comment. Hi, Steve. It's Carl Barbro. How are you Hi, today? Carl Tavarich, Kakpash of <laughs> So um, just as a uh, point of interest that in um, 1912, 1913, the Russians experimented with arming aircraft with machine guns. And it, <clears throat> they were on um, Duke built uh, farmings uh, using a maximum gun. And they discovered, you know, very quickly that there were problems uh, with the discharge of the cartridges getting into the uh, uh, the engine area and possibly causing problems. So they built in a uh, uh, cartridge reta retainer and they experimented with shooting at um, balloons, uh, small weather balloons, uh, trying air to air uh, uh, and as well as dummies on the ground to see what firing at targets on the ground would be. So they had all this in that pre-war period and it's really interesting to note that with that development, they didn't proceed into 1914 with armed aircraft. So for those who aren't, aren't uh, acquainted with Carl, uh, he was a uh, staff of the Smithsonian and a Russian aviation expert, particularly the Eastern Front and World War I. Uh, I'm sure he'll correct me on Nesterov if anything, I misconstrued anything uh, about that incident. But uh, I've learned a lot from Carl and uh, have become very much convinced that the Russians were actually somewhat ahead of the West in many ways in aviation development, especially some of the bigger airplanes like the uh, Sikorsky's. And just, uh, just to add for, especially for those who, um, or maybe newer to the meetings, Carl did a presentation on aviation on the Eastern Front um, in February. I believe this was February 2021. That is on the on the on our YouTube channel. Um, Steve's talk will be posted on the channel, and we have almost three years of of, of presentations. So I invite you to to uh, check out Carl's as well, and I'll put the. I'll put the link here for you of our, of our YouTube channel. I'll, I'll get that for you in just a second. And please, uh, please, uh, please go ahead with any, of course, with any other questions or comments you have for, for Steve. Okay. Um, this is good to be going, but thank you, Steve. Is that Sal? No, it's Jim Hockenberry. Oh, okay. Uh, I think someone was going to, I think someone had a question for Steve that she was going to um, ask. Yeah. Yeah. This is Alice Horner. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, good. Um, this is not actually for Steve. Uh, I had talked to Sal at the beginning of the meeting and he could not be here uh, because he had, is at a di different meeting, but um, he's going to be the speaker for January, but he didn't say what topic. Thank, yeah, thanks, Alice. Yes, of course, thanks. we will resume. Um, you know, we'll have our, our meeting at our, our regular time, um, which would be January 14th is the second Saturday. I believe I have that right? Yes. Uh, the 14th is the second Saturday of the month in January. Um, and I did put up the, the link for the YouTube channel. You can also access it in the meeting reminders that I, I know that many of you get and on the website as well. But you can see all, all of our presentations there, including the one I mentioned by Carl, some others by Steve, um, and many others who have contributed. Any other questions for, questions or comments for Steve? 
Thanks a lot, Steve. That was very informative. I oh, had no thanks idea. Thanks for listening. Hi, um, this is Jackie. Um, I have a question for Steve. Um, with respect to the uh, uh, downed pilot who died, um, what would have been done with his body? Would there have been, um, you know, a transfer of his remains to the Germans? Or would he have been buried in France? I uh, don't know. I don't know what the uh, situation was. I suspect at that time they would have buried them in their own uh, country. And I'm sorry, in the country where they fell. I don't know that for a fact, but that would be my uh, presumption. Uh, I don't think they got into uh, uh, body exchanges, except maybe in a few cases where they had uh, impromptu ceasefires mm -hmm. uh, during a, after a battle where both sides said, yeah, let's collect our wounded and our dead, and we'll have a ceasefire for a couple hours to do that. Mm -hmm. I think that happens some places like at Luz. And... Um, but I think that early in the war, I don't. I, I doubt if the uh, there was any uh, cross exchange between the belligerents. Okay, thank you. I'll mute myself now. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions, we will wrap it up here. Uh, just a reminder again, we'll be back on January 14th, uh, as Alice mentioned, Sal will be the speaker, but I know that Sal is, is always looking for speakers. So if you do have a topic you'd like to present on, um, please feel free to contact me or Sal. Let me just put our contact info in the chat. You can also find it on the website, but I'm going to give it to you in just a second. So you can reach us at, sorry, admin at world, or world war one ha.org. And then Sal's current email address. I'm just gonna put up for you in just one second. I'm gonna copy it to make sure I don't make a mistake. So here is Sal's, oops, sorry. Here is Sal's, ah, oh, it's not copying. <laughs> sorry, just give me one second. Um, so there's the, the general address for the association and then um, Sal's email address as well. Um, so if you if you would like to present, please do feel free to contact him and and um, we can get go from there. Again, thanks everyone for for renewing. Oh, thanks so much for all the renewals that have come in over the past few weeks by paper mail or uh, or online. And we really appreciate your support. And um, I know that uh, Sal, Randy, Ed all the, um, everyone at the association really values now that co as 2020 comes to a close and we we wrap up another year with the magazine, with these meetings, I know everybody values all of your contributions and participation. Um, so any final comments before we head out? Okay, well, thank you everyone so much. Have a happy holiday, a happy new year. Thank you very much, Steve. I, I also learned, I didn't know either uh, these stories at all and, and learned a lot. I really appreciate all the information you shared. Um, and a, a very happy new year to everybody. Same to you. Have a good day, everyone.